welcome back to the World Extreme Medicine podcast. My name's Will Duffin, GP and Education Lead. Now imagine summiting an 8,000 metre peak in the Himalayas. Pretty hard. Imagine trying to do that now with just one arm. Well, our guest today has done just that. My guest is Martin Hewitt. So Martin is a former officer in the parachute regiment who was medically discharged after career ending injuries while serving in Afghanistan in 2007. Uh, He was medically discharged from the military in 2012, but he didn't want his injuries to hold him back and indeed hold other people with disabilities back from achieving their dreams. He went on to captain the military disabled ski team and also went on to represent G, uh, Great Britain at the World Championships for Downhill, Super G and Slalom. In 2013, he founded the Adaptive Grand Slam, which is a registered charity that facilitates world record attempts, world firsts and extreme challenges undertaken by members of the disabled community, including wounded ex-service people. Um, And he believes that if you've got the support, drive and determination, a debilitating injury should not stop you from reaching your goals. Martin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Will. And whereabouts are you joining us from today? Uh, From home in Cheshire. Great, great. Quite a gloomy Cheshire. It's been quite nice the last couple of weeks. We've just suddenly had a turn. The weather has just turned on us, hasn't it? Yeah. So... um, Tell us a little bit about the uh, AGS, Adaptive Grand Slam. What's that all about? Uh, it, it started uh, initially with me decided to put a bit of an alternative take on a, a concept called the Explorers Grand Slam. And the Explorers Grand Slam is the phrase given to people that have climbed the highest peak on every continent of the world and walked unsupported, unassisted to both the geographic North and South Poles. Um, when I got injured, I looked for a challenge I had a number of different challenges and then kind of fell across this and thought, well, that sounds like a decent challenge. I'll give that a crack. Um, and then called it Adaptive Grand Slam because obviously we, we've got to adapt in more ways than one because of the nature of the injuries that we've got that we're trying to achieve this with. Yeah. And you, and your team, you've been working on each of the seven summits, so the highest peak on every continent. How far through that are you? Um, so, well, it's, it's start, like I said, it started with just myself, but we've now kind of, it's, kind of organically grown a little we've got other people involved and we do other things on top of that now uh, but on a personal level I've now climbed uh, Everest, Denali, Aconcagua, Elbrus, Kilimanjaro, walked to the North Pole um, so I've just got South Pole, Carson's Pyramid and Vincent to go. That's pretty good going and tell us take us back to your story a little bit Martin if that's okay so can you take us back to the time when you sustained your injuries when you were serving in Afghanistan what happened? Yeah, sure. So I was in charge of a small unit of uh, paratroopers in Afghanistan, and we were doing uh, what's called a recce and force. So we're basically trying to locate weaknesses in a in a defensive area that the enemy had hold of, and uh, and we came under contact. And after a number of uh, hours of fighting, I got uh, I got shot through the upper part of the chest and shoulder area by a, a PKM, which is a heavy machine gun, and the bullet went. Well, the first bullet went straight through the chest, um, went in above just above the uh, the protective kit that we have on, unfortunately. Um, so I had a, a femur neurox. I had a, a shattered my scapula as it left, but it also severed the uh, the brachial artery and all of the nerves to my right arm as it passed through. Um, and that rendered the right arm paralyzed. Um, about 10 minutes after that, when we were conducting what's called a fighting withdrawal, so you're basically trying to get yourselves out of there to a position where you can get some medical treatment. I then got shot again in the foot. But luckily, that one was just a flesh wound and hasn't caused any significant damage. Wow. So how were you medevaced out of that that pretty awful scenario? Well, so you, the kind of first phase is like incident management, in essence. You're basically trying to get yourself away from the area of the threat to a, a, as, as much of a secure location as you can. Um, and then you get medical treatment. So I had a, a team medic to come in and I'd, we'd been trying, me and a couple of the guys that were with me, we've been trying to put field dressings on and try and stop the blood flow because obviously our Arterial bleeding is fairly dangerous and you haven't got a great deal of time before you're in trouble with it. Uh, but we were, we failed just because the position that the bullet had struck in was really difficult. We couldn't get a tourniquet on. You couldn't you couldn't do that because of the area that had hit. So we were putting field dressings in, um, but we just, we just couldn't stand the blood flow. 
Um, what we did manage to do, though, was put some direct pressure onto the artery that had been severed. So the artery had, it actually started to retract uh, in, inside mm-hmm. as soon as it had been severed. So trying to get, I was trying to get, literally trying to get my fingers in there to kind of clamp it. Uh, so that one, obviously not being a doctor, <laughs> we did a bit of a amateurish attempt at that and it didn't go so well. Luckily got to a, a really, really competent medic and, and within within two minutes he'd sort me right out and I had So you managed to save your life, prevent that catastrophic bleeding. Yeah, they they'd stem the catastrophic bleed. They managed to get then a, a load of saline into me. Um could put a few put a number of lines into my left arm. And then what's called a MERT team. A medical evacuation response team came in in a helicopter and that had a full medical crew on board and they again they they maintained that stabilization and uh, and they started pumping me with plasma and getting some fluids into me uh, by this point to be honest with you, I, i'm not i can't remember too much about what was happening because by that point I'd lost, I'd lost quite a lot of blood um i then got a morphine shot in a helicopter on the way to a, a field hospital which was in a, a camp bastion which was the main kind of camp that we had in helmand at the time and then I just remember coming out of the uh, helicopter onto an ambulance, got driven to the uh, theatre, to the operating table. And then I just remember a doctor saying to me, we're going to put you into a coma and you're going to wake up in Birmingham. Um, and then luckily, I, uh, I woke up in Birmingham a, a day later. Wow. And how did that feel being just one minute you're on the battlefield, next minute you're waking up in Birmingham with you can't use your, your right arm? What was that like? Well, um, the, I think the... the not being able to use the arm part of it didn't really take in until until probably several days later. I mean, by that point, I was pumped with so much morphine that you're kind of in a slightly different space anyway. But I think because the doctor had told me what was happening beforehand, when I came around, I kind of knew where I was and knew what was happening. And luckily, I managed to maintain consciousness before he said that. And so I kind of knew where I was and what was going on. Obviously, I had a tracheotomy and I had all sorts of tubes coming out of me and on lines on me. So um, that was uncomfortable, to be honest. Um, but luckily, like psychologically, I knew where I was and knew what was happening. So I was just in a place where I was just trying to rest, to be honest with you. You know, you, you go through any kind of significant trauma like that and your body just needs a lot of rest. So I was just trying to stay relaxed, stay calm and rest for the first few days. And what was your what was the recovery like from there? Uh, it was it was long winded, to be honest. Um, I think one of the challenges you have with nerve damage is that you're not you're not really sure of what kind of recovery you can get if any mm. um with brachial plexus injuries in particular the prognosis is, isn't great to be honest for any kind of significant functional recovery um mm. but we had a really good team of docs around us who were giving us advice and guidance on what the art of the possible was the first thing well i was in i was in intensive care for a week for a start and then when i got taken out of that onto the ward um we then started having conversations with the doctor about what was needed. The first thing that needed to be done was a, a vein graft. So they extracted, they opened up my, the entire length of my right arm um, from the wrist all the way up to the armpit and extracted veins to reconnect the blood flow to the arm. Um, and then I had to rest that and keep that still for a month to let that vein graft settle. Um, by the end of that month, my arm had kind of seized into my chest then. So um, we were talking then around what, physio was and what that would look like when you get out of here whatever you're going to go hopefully headley court um but then a decision was taken that they were going to do a, a median nerve graft to try and hopefully one day get some sort of functional return for the bicep so they yep. took a 30 centimeter graft from my left calf from the serial nerve and grafted mm. that into my uh, into my bicep into the median mm. and um and then again my arm had to stay still so i remained in hospital for another few weeks and then I went down to Headley Court, which at the time was in uh, in Leatherhead in, in Surrey. Um, and that was a phenomenal place. I was loaded onto a, an upper limbs course. Um, and for the next two years, really, I was in and out of the, uh, in and out of a hospital with further operations, exploratory operations. And then we also looked into an intercostal nerve transfer, which unfortunately didn't take. Um, but after two years of the initial median nerve graft, I was walking down the, the hall, actually, i just come back from the gym, and one of the occupational therapists was walking past, and as he always said, a guy called George, top guy, just said, have you got any any return of the bicep yet? And I said, no. And as I said it, he said, Martin, your bicep's just flickered. And I was like, mate, you're having a laugh, you're taking a mick here. And then I looked down and did it again, and, and it was a tiny flicker. Mm. And and then a year and a half after that, um, I then started being able to you know use the arm to, to a degree and that I could pull it up. Um, so I could pull the limb in as on the on the hole through the bicep, uh, but everything else is still dead. The pec's dead because they had to sever the nerves of the pec in order to get access to the brachial plexus area when they opened it up. Um, so 
Yeah, so that was uh, it's quite a long process. Yeah, so thirteen operations wow. in total in total after over wow. a kind of two two and a half year period. That's one hell of a journey. And were there any points during that where you just sat and thought to yourself, "I'm never going to get back to doing the things that I used to love doing"? Um, I think the first the first six to eight weeks, I was in complete denial. To be honest with you, about the severity mm. of the injury, I because my arm was still there and it was still attached, I I just felt on part of. The, I mean, a lot of this is down to the mindset of a paratrooper as well. You, you, you do have to develop a certain mindset to be able to kind of do that job and perform and, and thrive in that organization. And that mm. part of that is a dogged determination to do anything. And so I was a hundred percent determined that I would do whatever it took. The doctors would do what they would need to do. And my arm would become fully functional again. I'll be back out in Afghanistan before the end of that tour. So, mm. uh, massive lack of understanding on my part on, uh, <laughs> on yeah. the injury. Well, it meant that I had a mindset where I was going to get back and I was going to start doing things again with work and it wouldn't affect yeah. my career negatively. And it took, I'd say, it probably took about two years before I realised that that wasn't going to happen. Um, yeah. And that was, a, that was a long two years. Um, mm. And so you're in a place where you you really are at risk of hitting what I've always described as a bit of a circle of decline psychologically. Mm. You know, you start mm. to, you could start to let the situation kind of overpower you and and mm. be, um, be consumed by it. Uh, and you've got to kind of take, measures to prevent that from happening and luckily for me i was in a place where there were opportunities starting to uh, become available to get involved with anything whether it was mm. kind of art therapy kind of crafts and, and design or or sport um, and mm. then eventually adventurous training and, and an adaptive sport program called battleback was started um, and i got mm. involved in the first kind of trip that they did which was an adaptive skiing course yep. went into that and that kind of gave me a focus and that's what i was looking for i was looking, looking for some form of positive focus during a challenging yeah. time because when i first got hit you know i'd gone from being in command of a you know a large amount of soldiers at a fairly young age in a, a high pressured environment to suddenly having no responsibility whatsoever over 24 hours mm. and that's that, you know that can be quite dangerous mm. yeah that must say that's a huge adjustment to, to make it is it, it is mm. it is it's uh, more psychological than physical you know whilst you're on a practical level you know every yeah. day i was trying to teach myself right because i was right hand dominant before i got shot you know so yeah. everything from you know cleaning your teeth with your non-dominant arm you know tying up a tie buttoning up a shirt yeah. tying shoelaces yeah. you know you're learning practical things and, and to be honest some things come really quickly um yeah. some things you have to accept that will never be the as you'll never be as efficient with and mm-hmm. they will never be the same again but you become better obviously the more you the more you practice and the more you train so on a product level yeah. i was doing that my parents had bought me you know whilst i was still in hospital key stage one two and three handwriting books so i just started yeah. learning to write again um, mm-hmm. but it was more on a psychological level you know what am i actually going to do now what does life look like what kind of what can i do to kind of get back into work or to find yeah. meaningful occupation again and a job that you kind of thrive in which is what I had in the military. So that was a much harder battle than the, the yeah. practical aspect of learning to kind of brush my teeth with my left hand. Yeah. And you really threw yourself into the adapt into adaptive skiing. Yeah, I did. Well, to be honest with you, I threw myself into that because it was the first opportunity that we was, was kind of created. <laughs> um, and I was desperate to do anything, to do something. So, uh, yeah, luckily skiing was a sport I'd done before, um, not to yeah. any kind of significant level. Um, I've done the odd ski week here and there on holiday. Um, and I've done a bit at university, but I've never done a season or anything like that. And this opportunity came up just to do a week. Um, went on the week. I met a, a major there who was, um, at the time, he was the former former captain of the of the uh, army ski team. And he yeah. just, with a few other people, said, look, we'd love to establish a, an adaptive ski team with injured soldiers. And we look to have yeah. a a team ideally go and race against the army ski team at the army ski championships. Yeah. Um, said, Would you be interested in kind of getting involved with that? And I said, yeah, sure. Went back to my unit. Um, luckily my, my chain of command of my unit were really supportive and said, look, you know, you kind of take the time you need to do whatever you want to do and while you're recovering. So I said, well, an opportunity to come up to go and do some ski racing. So I took it. Um, really the aspiration was to race against everybody's soldiers at a ski championships and not to go and race for great britain but you know one thing yeah. led to another and i then went pro and raced full-time for three years yeah did you feel that really gave you a purpose like a new lease of life like you know, kind of something to really positive to to move forwards for, from the injury with i mean it was yeah it was a positive step but i, I mean it's uh I think the biggest thing he gave me was, was was a task to focus on. 
and, mm. and you are in the military, you're kind of ingrained to become task focused um, mm. and have structure in what you're doing and have and set yourself goals. And, and that's what adaptive sport provided for me. Um, so I was really grateful for that. Whilst at the time, that wasn't necessarily something that I was actively thinking about. I was just thinking about doing something that I enjoyed, doing something that would get me fit after each one. Because I'm still undergoing operations in hospital, each of which was, you know, 30 minutes to 10 hours in length wow. with quite a decent rehabilitation period afterwards. Mm-hmm. So I had to be careful on on that. And I, I wasn't in a position as a result to realistically get uh, what I perceived to be another kind of intensive job, either in the military or out, when I was going to have to be constantly asking for time off to go and have another operation. And I wouldn't be able to tell an employer how many weeks I'd be out of action for afterwards. So it was quite a it was it was quite a good opportunity to basically do something that I could manage with the recovery of my injury, um, mm-hmm. and the other benefits of it were that it kept you fit, it kept you busy, you know, it, it was something positive to to kind of do on a day to day basis. Absolutely, and so 2013 was when you set AGS up. Uh, tell us how that how that came about. What kind of conversations were you having with with people? Yeah, so I, well, after the skiing, really, I kind of, I was looking to hopefully represent Great Britain at uh, Sochi Paralympics. So I went to Vancouver to uh, watch that, really, and learn. And then after that, I went to the World Championships. And World Championships and adaptive ski racing kind of sits. So you've got different performance levels. You've got like, national champs. you then got Europa Cup. Yeah. And then you've got World Cup, World Champs, and Paralympics all sit at the same performance level. So I'd gone to that level and then yeah. and, and just saw the quality of the competition most of them have been skiing since they were kids. You know, many of them had quite a lot of resource around them. They were skiing all year round, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. They had, you know, techs with them, SNCs and physios and ski coaches for a good deal of the year. And basically we didn't. So we had, we had, yeah. we had them at times in, in places. Um, and the talent level there was really high. And I just kind of did a bit of a honest kind of, conversation with myself and said look you know you're competing against people here that are really good and yeah. I'm not quite sure if I've got the talent level to to kind of compete and to realistically get gold at this nor do I think that did you did you feel a little bit like Yeovil Town looking at Man City with all of their resources and money yeah something like that but Yeovil Town yeah. where if you get it wrong on a ski jump at kind of 70 mile an hour on a downhill course there's a few more consequences to quite. football uh, missing the missing the goal so yes. um so yeah, and I, of course, every time you have a big crash with a you know paralysed arm, it tends to lead to a broken collarbone. So I broke a collarbone mm. four times crashing. So uh, it must be difficult because you probably can't brace yourself quite as well. Do you find that if you land on that side, it's quite hard to to take that take that hit, take that fall? Yeah, well, the, the well the two issues, the, the technical issue is that when you hit the jump, you you're not aerodynamic because the arms kind of a dead weight, it's slung into the yeah. chest. You can't main that maintain that position in the air, so you start over-rotating and leaning to the left, which mm. unless you're really good at it, which I wasn't, you know, you're then increasing the chances of landing on your outside edge on your downhill leg. And that's yeah. kind of a recipe for disaster. So there was yeah. that uh, when it came to the speed events, but even on the on the technical events, you you take an impact and all the muscle mass is gone because of mm. the nerve damage. So, mm. you know, you, there's, you, you can't sweat. The, my right limb doesn't sweat. So uh, there's, there's heat issues there, which I found out about later on in, when I did the mm. marathon so I've, You've got, you know, sensation issues there. But the big issue is on for that it for that sport was that whenever I hit the deck, there's no muscle to protect the bones. It's all mm-hmm. within the way. So it just increases the chances of you breaking it. So I broke a collarbone four times and my humerus twice. Wow. Um which yeah. Can, which each yeah, wow. and you can kind of crack on stuff with that, but you know, it's not really not really helping you get your fist points down to try and compete at the next level up. So uh Yeah, quite a vicious sport. Oh, it's a brilliant sport, <laughs> but it is yeah. a sport, but a sport yeah. where there are there are definitely consequences to mistakes in that game. Um, so, so how did you how did you go from being a you know a Olympic level skier to setting up the AGS? How did that kind of tra- that transition come about? When I decided to pull, I realised that you know having positive focus for people with a life changing injury really helps, not just in being fit physically, but being fit mentally or getting fit mentally again. Um, and all the all the benefits that come from that to help them get back into some form of kind of value added position in society again, in my opinion. So I wanted to get involved in providing that through other means. And I got an email from a, a, a charity, an armed forces charity that was just being established called Walking with the Wounded. And what they were looking to do was finance education courses for soldiers, sailors, and airmen that have been injured 
who perhaps hadn't been in the military long enough to get the skills that would make them um, attractive to employers outside. You know, really good transferable skills that you get in the military. Um, but these, you were getting guys who were getting injured at kind of 18, 19 years of age that hadn't been in that long, who are suddenly now going to be faced with leaving um, with a limb missing, two limbs missing, three limbs missing, whatever, it's, whatever it was. Um, some of whom were very well qualified and had some great technical skills, but some of whom didn't have any academic or technical skill um, that they yeah. could realistically use. So this charity wanted to finance courses towards that um, and they wanted to do something that was going to basically get the charity off the ground. So we decided to do an unsupported, unassisted expedition to the geographic North Pole, uh, which had never been done before by anybody with a disability. Um, and so that for me was, uh, I'd always wanted to do the Explorers Grand Slam. You know, I'd always read about that. And I thought this is an opportunity for me to kind of fast track the starting of that with a team rather than doing it on my own. Um, did that expedition. We had some challenges with that expedition, um, but ultimately we, we managed to achieve it. We, we did it a lot faster than what anyone thought we would. Um, and then I just wanted to take it to the next level. I wanted to kind of see through this this idea of doing the, the seven plus two. Um, and then I started getting emails from people that had seen some of the stuff that we'd done on the news or on social media, uh, you know, sending us messages about their story um, and could they get involved, but they weren't in the military. They, they were civilians, someone had been born with a disability or had an industrial accident. Um, and the service charities, when you set up a charity, you've got charitable objects and you, you can't deviate from that. Um, mm -hmm. And the armed forces charities are mostly specifically for members of the armed forces or veterans, so they couldn't mm -hmm. take civilians on. And so I basically then decided to turn the Adaptive Grand Slam into an organisation uh, that would facilitate opportunities for people with disabilities to get involved with expeditions and, and significant challenge events. So you wanted to share what um sport the outdoors and that the kind of adventurous activities had done for you in your recovery you want to be able to share that with uh other people with disabilities yeah outdoors in particular i mean sport was fantastic and sport is great but i think the outdoor environment the natural environment it brings a lot more challenge than than i found sport does um, yeah. in sport you're competing against other human beings and you know, there's the physicality there's the technical skill and you get some phenomenally talented athletes doing what others can't but in the expedition world and in the natural world the physical component is just one aspect of what you've got to do in order to mm. succeed but also to survive um, because nature will destroy you if you are not careful and if you don't respect it and you don't prepare yeah. for it and that for me given the kind of background that I had and the experiences that I had before I got shot was a, a greater challenge and a more attractive a challenge. And so I thought, you know, there's also challenges with disability in accessing the outdoors. There's an increased yeah. cost, there's an increased risk, and it puts a lot of people off. You know, we started getting approached yes. by people saying, I'd love to have done this, but, you know, so we said, well, what are your buts? Um, and often it was, I haven't got the confidence to go back into the mountains because I've got a limb missing or because I'm disabled now. Um, or, yeah. there's too many barriers to me doing it. No one's willing to take me because they see me as disabled and therefore it might not pass their risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gripped me a little bit. So I thought, right, what do we need to do to make this realistic for people? Yeah. Um, started looking at kind of governance out there and you know, whilst in ski racing and, and skiing as a recreational sport, there's adaptive skiing instructors courses that you can go on. There's not really an adaptive yeah. mountaineering course at, for kind of practitioner level or instructor level. Um, and so yeah. I started looking and approaching IFMGAs, you know, so really highly qualified mountain guides and then started yeah. targeting people that I knew who I felt had the right kind of personal character as well as technical skill and experience to be able to facilitate opportunity for people with disability for whom they might need a bit of extra work or support in confidence building or in a bit yeah. of extra patience because the technical aspects of the climb might take a bit longer. Um, and so the fitness levels are going to be high because the non-technical aspects are going to be covered at a faster pace to compensate for the time you'll lose on the technical mm. aspects. So there's, there's going to be a lot more to it than the physicality alone. And that was really the attraction, both of setting up the organization and of me doing it on a personal level. Yeah. And do you think there's a, a real misconception in the media and the general public about what people with disabilities should be able to do, what environments they should be able to go into? Uh, well, I think there is, but not necessarily for the fault of the media or of, of society. I think the, the challenge that you face, disability obviously is a word that's used to describe uh, anyone that ha isn't fully embodied. And actually, a lot of people in the disabled community don't like the word. I've mm. never really got into that space myself. I'm 
pretty thick skin. I don't care what people say about anything, to be honest with you, when it comes to me personally. But yeah. um, you've you've got a disability is different to different people. What is the nature of the injury or the illness, the impairment, and what effect does that have on your ability to do something? And that has got to, and therefore you've got to have a tailored solution or approach to every individual. And to articulate that and it requires time and effort and thought. And not everyone's always got the willingness or the ability to do that. So there's reason for it. Um, it's like the Paralympics. You know, you, I came out of London 2012. We suddenly had adaptive sport mania in the country, which was fantastic. And people started talking about the classification system and factors and. And that's basically the the way in which they try and create as level a playing field as they can uh, to make sport fair but competitive for people with disabilities. When the reality is often, it, it, if I'm being frank, it doesn't work because the factors are so far away from from you know the the level of um, of impairment that person has relative to other people in the same yeah. sport. So it, it's it's really challenging to get that accurate. Yeah, and uh, you and your team were uh, on Everest. Uh, in last year's season, what was that like? Uh, oof, a mix of feelings and emotions and experiences from exceptional through to extremely frustrating for more than one reason. Um, I mean, that in compared to other mountains that I've done, mountain ranges, the, the big attraction with the Himalayas is just the sheer scale of the place. It, it is enormous. And Everest in particular, I mean, I've, I've climbed Manistel with another 8,000 metre peak. And, and I think the big difference with, with Everest and other 8,000 metre peaks is that with Everest, you've got Nutsi and Lotsi right there as well. You've got 38,000 metre peaks in one fairly small area, and the scale of it is just breathtaking. And um, and that's attractive. It's, tra- it's attractive to experience, which is why the, the, a lot of the trekking routes around there are so popular. You're in an amazing environment. Mm. Um, the challenge of high altitude mountaineering is really attractive for me and for a lot of other people that do it. You've mm. got a you've got a dynamic that is different. You know, it's not necessarily just about the technical climbing aspect or the physical fitness. It's about, can your body physiologically adapt to the atmospheric conditions that you're going to experience there? And that brings with it uh, a series of different challenges. Um, You are going to have an unpleasant experience and that's a test ultimately. Um, But you've got to be careful. Uh, You you get that wrong and you're going to end up with a a cerebral edema, a pulmonary edema, or at the very least, you know, fairly serious mountain sickness and you don't want any of that really uh, and so that is a, a different challenge uh, yeah. but I think the, the biggest challenge that we faced last year which has been kind of that was the second time that I've, I've been to Everest we had to abandon our first attempt in 2012 because of avalanche risk um, yeah. but since 2012 this time there's just been a, a significant change on the mountain over, over the past five years with an increase in in the amount of uh, commercial operators that are obviously mm-hmm. not really doing any due diligence on who they're taking and so you've got a combination of an increased um, increased amount of people that have got the means and, and um, the resource to go there now, um, <clears throat> combined with people trying to make money, basically. Uh, and that yeah, has yeah. resulted in a really dangerous kind of, um, real dangerous situation where there's, there's people there that haven't got the, the technical skill or the high altitude experience to really give that mountain a first shot. And that results in kind of bottlenecks being created in certain areas where you really don't want to be stuck in a queue. Did you find that you uh, there's a long queue on your summit? It did that that really held you back? Well, we were well, we kind of we knew it was coming because we could see you know how much you're mountaineering. You're out there for weeks acclimatizing, so you get to know the environment, you get to know the mountain, and you can you know you can see what's coming. And we we just saw the numbers that were going up there, and through the acclimatization process, we read the Dalsen Pomori. Um, which is a completely different mountain to avoid going through um, the Cumbie Rice Field more times than. Uh, that's than quite a clever idea. So that was yeah. the reason for doing Pomori. Now, the, the risk with Pomori yeah. in the past was that the avalanche risk on Pomori is quite high. But in, 20, in two years ago, there was a big earthquake, and uh, and some of the seracs on Pomori had then either reduced in size or had, had gone as a result of that earthquake. Mm-hmm. Now, the avalanche risk is still there. But if you've got a decent, experienced team and you know what you're doing, and most importantly, you're willing to make the right decisions at the right time, you can kind of mitigate some of that risk. You've got to accept that you'll never get rid of it all, and you could be unlucky. But that mount, that mountain became less risky in our opinion and in the opinion of our, our technical and, and safety yeah. lead, who's the most experienced guy I've ever come across in the Himalayas, a guy called Russell Bryce. Yeah. Um, and, and that mountain us 
reduce the amount of times you'd have to go through the Cumber Rice Field. Now, the biggest issue with the Cumber Rice Field is that it's the biggest area on Everest with un- uncontrollable risk. You've got yeah. a V-shaped valley, you've got Seracs either side, and again, some of them have kind of gone, but there are still a number there after the earthquake. Mm-hmm. And um, and if one comes down in there, and I've been hit by an avalanche in there in 2012, and you can't get out of it. There's nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. You are literally mm-hmm. going to get it. Now, you mitigate that risk by going through there at night. The temperature's mm-hmm. lower, less chance of avalanche, yeah. but obviously a, an increased risk of frostbite because of the cold temperatures. Yeah, but yeah. With, you know, the kit the equipment now is so good. Decent kit, decent equipment combined with the right level of experience and good yeah. personal administration means that you shouldn't really be getting frostbite. You've either been really unlucky or you've kind of made a mistake yeah. if you're getting frostbite on on that mountain yeah. in that area. So you kind of take that as a as a bit of a best course of action. But some of these teams are going through that ice field, you know, six, eight, ten, twelve times, and that's mm. kind of asking for it. So we Yeah, it's accumulatively that risk all adds up. It does, it does. And you get stuck behind someone who's having trouble in there for one reason or another and you're being delayed and again there's nowhere to go. So mm. it's it's a bit of a risk you don't really want to take unless you have to. So you yeah. kind of either way, you you, you do your commentation, how are you going to do it? You see people, you see other teams. And right from the off, you know, we were seeing people that it was obvious that they had never put crampons on before. You know, it was obvious that they'd never used an ice axe before. They, you look, they get to an anchor point change over basically mm. bits of, you know, either a, an ice screw into a piece of ice or a big stake in the ground to give you a safety mm. mechanism. You basically put rope through this and you've got a safety point. The idea being that if you... If you do have a fall, you're only falling down to the the next anchor point, not all the way down the mountain. Um, but we were, other teams ahead of us who were acclimatizing on it, you could see like 20, 30 people all on one anchor point. Many of them wow. were using the rope to climb with rather than uh, rather than kind of climbing traditionally. Now there are times yeah. when the ropes there, you kind of we all do it. You will use it occasionally, but I'm talking about yeah. people that were using it permanently every step of the yeah. way, uh, mm-hmm. who just by the foot movements you can see they've got very limited or no experience with crampons at all yeah yeah um, and on a either at a climatization or at a fitness level their pace is so slow there's no way they're yeah, going to make the the the, the time of a safe timing to get from camp to camp so we yeah. can see that ahead of us um and as a result on our summit day we on from the south call to the balcony there's several areas there where you can actually overtake people with you know by coming off the anchor points it's you're taking a risk doing it, but it's fairly non technical. Yeah, it's pretty sketchy. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's fairly non technical terrain. And actually, if you're alpine yeah. climbing's of a half decent standard, Everest mm. from the south approach anyway isn't a particularly technical mountain to climb. You know, if you mm. didn't have a, if you didn't have the ladders and the and the on the crevasse crossings in the ice field, you'd be climbing around them and climbing up and down. That'd be a different board mm. game. If you're climbing an alpine style, different board game. But mm. you know, the way it is at the minute, it's not a it's not a particularly yeah, Pumori was much more difficult to climb than Everest, put it that way. Yeah. Um, obviously, the big challenge that comes with Everest is the increased um, challenge you've got with the, the altitude, um, and yeah. that slows your pace down, regardless of what strategy you've got in place, regardless of you know what your oxygen plan is. If you're using oxygen, yeah. which the majority of climbers are doing, you're yeah, still yeah. going to be suffering with that, and that has an impact on your speed. But there are still relatively safe time frames that you should be getting from camp to yeah, camp yeah, yeah. and if you're not you kind of need to be taking the decision to abandon and take yourself down or yeah, yeah. if it's a commercial operation and this is where the biggest kind of problems come from those responsible for the team should be telling people that they're turning around and that just yeah that obviously yeah. isn't happening at all mm-hmm. um so that that, that was the, yeah. the human factor was by far the biggest risk and the biggest kind of sour point of it yeah, it's really, I mean, the, the other mountaineers I've spoken to, uh, have, have, have the same sentiment is, is coming from them. And it sounds like there needs to be a kind of frank discussion with uh, the Nepalese government that hands out the permits on, you know, how they can just rationalise the, the numbers. And maybe there could be some kind of screening process to make sure that people are up to the challenge that, that you know, you don't just get people with minimal experience on there for commercial reasons and putting everyone at risk. I mean, it's been hard, and there's, um, I mean, there's some of the operators that've been there for a long time. You look the likes of Himex, kind of, you know, Adventure Consultants, I, uh, IMG. You know, some of these, some of these guys have been on the mountain for decades. They they've got yeah. long-standing relationships with the government, and they've and they've they've even created their own kind of mutually kind of agreed safe practice of what they will do to to make things, and they help each other out with this an issue. And they help. Obviously, the, the rope fixing teams kind of been separated again now, and that created issues this year again. Uh, but there are it's almost like a code of conduct up there that, that the right things should be done, and, and many of the organisations have always done that and do do that. Um, but more recently, they're frustrated because they've tried to speak to the government, and the government 
frankly aren't really that interested. Uh, so yeah, you're then yeah, in a position of, well, it is what it is. You either take your risk and you go with it, that's what you want, and you accept yeah, the risk yeah. or you don't. I mean, what they've announced this year is that you've got to have done another 6,500 metre peak in Nepal, and yeah. expedition companies need to charge a minimum of $30,000, I think it was that they said. And the reason mm. for that is that some of these kind of operators that aren't doing things properly, they want to maintain their profit margin, so they'll take the safety things out mm. to maintain the profit margin, and so they'll cut costs by extracting the safety measures. Um, so that's where the, the minimum spend is coming from, and that's the justification for that. But saying a, a 6,000-metre peak or a 6,500-metre Nepali peak, it kind of doesn't really... There's a world of difference yeah. between 6,500 metres and 8,800 metres. There really is. Um, yeah. Whereas on the Tibetan side, the Chinese have limited the amount of summit attempts for a start, yeah. and they've yeah. insisted that you've already you've got to have had another successful 8,000 metre peak in, in your bag. Yeah. And that would, yeah. in my opinion, that's probably the furthest of all the options out there, rather than kind of a, yeah. um, you know, a lottery-style system, which some people have talked about. Um, because at least then, if someone's successfully climbed another 8,000 metre peak, yeah. Firstly, the individual knows. I mean, some people will not acclimatize. You could be the best technical climber in the world. You could be phenomenally fit. Um, but if your body physiologically can't adapt to that atmospheric condition, that's just the way it is, you know. I mean, there's yeah. things you can do. You can slow your pace down and make sure you're hydrated. You know, a lot of teams yeah, now, yeah. a lot of people take Diamox, which, you know, a lot of people really rate. So there are things yeah, you yeah. can do to maximize your chances. But if you can't do it, you can't do it. And that's kind yeah. of ain't going to change. And you're better off finding that out on a a Cho OU or a Manus Lou, which is going to cost you yeah, less yeah, money yeah. for a start and is less risk, technically speaking, to get down from than, than Everest or a K2 yeah, yeah. and on Everest. Um, and secondly, obviously the organisation that you're going with or the team that you're going with now know that you can acclimatise. Mm-hmm. Um, but more importantly, the Sherpa, who ultimately, and, and those that are responsible for Medivax and Kazivax off that mountain and, and the helicopter pilots, you know, you've protected them because then they know at least that someone's got some form of mountaineering experience and altitude experience before yeah. they get to Everest. And that, yeah. just from a, really from a responsible business and a duty care perspective, is the, the biggest reason for doing this, in my opinion. Yeah. And uh, g- going back to you, so you've got an upper limb injury. What are the kind of specific considerations when you're trying to negotiate ladders over crevasses and use an ascender across a fixed line? You know, how does that really change the game for for you? And how have you adapted to that? A number of different areas, really. First of all, you've got a balance issue on the ladders. So you need to ensure that you're in your training, that you're addressing your core stability. Um, you've got, the limb is, you don't realise how heavy your limbs are until you can't use them. And it is yeah. quite, it's quite a heavy piece of dead weight on one side. Um, so first of all, I had to try and stabilise that so it wasn't moving around and you know creating additional problems. So I designed a, uh, a sling, which was kind of hooked onto my rucksack with a callet with a crab. Um, and that meant that the, the arm was kind of supported. Uh, the shoulders are at risk of subluxing because of the nerve damage and the muscle loss. Mm. So you want to try and protect that. So again, the sling helps with that. You then got a, a heating issue. Uh, the circulation damage means that you've got an increased risk of frostbite. And you know, we had the same thing. We have the same thing with our amputees and our teams. So you're mm. trying to insulate the damaged limb um, while simultaneously not overheating the core. So we have a different layering system on the limb. So on my base layer, I have a merino wool base layer on my entire body. And then I have a second merino wool layer on my right arm, followed by with, um, I have little patches sewn into it, which I can put chemical compound heat pads into if it gets really cold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and obviously at altitude, there's an administrative responsibility there and that you've got to get that open early because it takes a while for it to heat up. They then go in. I then put a Prima Loft layer on top of that, which then has a Velcro tab on top, which connects onto my base layer on my, my body. Um, and then a synthetic layer, which is integrated into my, my jacket. So I'm insulating the right arm while it's not overheating on my, my body. Um, and then you've got to accept that actually the reality is that the, some of the more technical aspects on Primori, for example, you know, we got to about 6,200, 6,300 in Primori and, and the first of the flipping 70 to 90 degree walls were kind of treated us with a bit of an experience and yeah. we even had a nice overhang. We had an overhang at about 6,400 meters, which was ridiculous. Um, and that's just going to take time. It's going to take you longer. There's safety implications around that. In case you do go, you've only got three points of contact. So there's an issue there. Um, and so we really have to use additional anchor points. Um, so, you know, you carry a few extra ice screws uh, and teamwork comes in. You know, our, our yeah. lead climbers, one, we've worked together a lot. So we know each other's strengths and weaknesses. 
they get ahead. Uh, Woody was lead climbing that day. He got ahead. And then we, we actually had a system for the overhang where we could attach our ascenders to one another. So we would both push up at the same time on the overhang. Um, and then if I did go, I've got an extra piece of security through his ascender. Um, luckily, I didn't go. We didn't need it. Um, but just real clear communication of when I'm going to go, when I'm going to push up on the on the fixed line um, so that he obviously go at the same time. And yeah. then, you know, as everyone gets taught when they first start climbing, climb with your legs, not your arms, which women mm-hmm. seem to be far better at than men. <laughs> so, um, yeah, right. I, yes, uh, yes. On that, that's a really look at your position in advance. And we talked about the route in advance and, you know, before we even approached it, again, you don't with how to climb and anything with gravasses on, you've got to be mm-hmm. careful on how you're assessing the route and where you're going to be stopping for that. So mm-hmm. getting the binos out frequently, long long lenses on, looking at the overhang and what mm-hmm. the route around that was going to look like. And there was a little piece on the right-hand side where you could get your crampons stuck in and kind of use that as a bit of a wedge and then up and over, which is mm-hmm. kind of how we took it. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of that means that ultimately you're going to be taking a longer time period than someone who's embodied on the technical mm-hmm. features. So... Again, that comes back to your, your preparation, your admin time, your fitness mm-hmm. levels, the non-technical pieces and phases have got to be done quickly. Um, mm-hmm. So your training's got to be done to the standard required to save that time. Yeah. And obviously at altitude, you're doing it in the knowledge that you're going to be uh, breathing out of the obvious and that's going to be unpleasant. Yeah, right. so, yeah, uh, yeah, it's quite... So your climatization wow. plan, our, our climatization yeah. plan was really thorough. You know, we, we, took, yeah. we took 10 days from um, from Nancy Bazaar to base camp, which is a route yeah. that you... If you acclimatize, you'd comfortably do in two or three. Um, mm-hmm. But we were really steady lower down. Uh, lots yeah, of hydration, yeah. lots of resting. Uh, you felt that paid off later on. Oh, big time. Yeah, and, and past, yeah. you know, Denali, uh, both Fakin Kagwa's the previous Everest attempt. We've, yeah. we've t- traditionally in the past, have, partly because of us, I think, partly because of the, some of the team members, we've not necessarily acclimatized as sensitive yeah, as yeah. you could. We've kind of rushed it a bit. And, and often, and actually, because of weather windows, you've got a real tight weather window. So we've had yeah. to go for it. Uh, I mean, our first, like in Cagua, we went from um, Penitentes to Camp yeah. 3 in, in four days. You know, it was ridiculous, yeah. you know, so. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Martin, tell me what it's like for your teammates who have lower limb injuries, who are wearing prosthetic limbs. That must be a whole different ball game as well. Yeah. So, again, you've got to look at the, we have to look at the injury itself, the individual, the injury uh, the technical competency and how we think that injury is going to impact their ability to do the challenge or the expedition. So to give a few examples, um, on the North Pole, when we did that, we had a, a team member with a below knee leg amputee, um, real, real robust, strong guy, cold guy, actually. And um, and he he had a mindset where the concern, I think, within the team was that he's going to keep on going no matter what. And so we had to do some work with each other. And we ought to do this where... We and um, we have a, a really good occupational psychologist that helps us develop as a, as a team before everything now, who talk about you know reds and greens. They bring in kind of organisational psychology into it, how we want to behave with each other, what that looks like, what good behaviour looks like, what bad behaviour looks like. And when you're dealing with a lot of kind of headstrong alpha characters, you really need to get to the crux of you know we are going to tell each other if we're suffering because there's things we can do to mitigate risk and and to nip things in the bud before it becomes a major issue. And so with him, it was a case of making sure that, one, he had the administration time because with a, with a stump down there, you're going to sweat and the socket gets wet and that can cause mm. friction. The big problem you've got with leg amputees, amputees any kind of endurance event is that if you get friction on a stump, it's game over. It's not like mm. you know someone with two legs, you know, two feet, you get a bit of a blister, everyone's got the different approaches, but many will put a bit of compede on, kind of suck it up, crack on, mm. and you're kind of okay. You aren't doing that on a stump. It, the, the pain is excruciating. And it takes such a long time for it to recover that it's pretty much game over. So stump administration is really key, really important. Um, secondly, on a prolonged expedition in particular, the stump is going to reduce in size. So the mm-hmm. diameter of that stump is going to shrink as your body weight starts to reduce. And we did the North Pole. It was an unsupported, unassisted expedition. And we were looking at having a calorie deficiency of two to two and a half thousand calories a day for up to a month. So we had to plan for the, his stump reducing in size. So... What you're going to do with that? You're either going to you, many people will increase the amount of um, amount of socks that they put on to increase the volume before it goes into the silicon line and into the carbon fiber. Um, but the problem with that is that one, it's overheating, so you're going to have this problem with the stump sweating more. So we he worked with a really good uh, prosthetist to create a real simple solution in the carbon fiber of the prosthetic limb at the front of it. There was a hole cut, um, like a, a U-shaped hole, and then we attached a, a ski ratchet to it. 
so we could reduce the uh, the circumference of that limb over time, not of that prosthetic over time. Uh, and he went down three notches over the course of the expedition. Uh, but that worked really well. Uh, another example on Everest or Pumori, um, one of our uh, teams on that, another Bologna like amputee, um, because of the technicalities of, of climbing, you know, and we had just sheer, sheer blue ice on Pumori. We've been really, mm. a lot of wind swept this year. So uh, even the, the Lotsey Wall, was, it was just bare. There was no snow on it. It was bulletproof. Mm. And so you, obviously you're kicking in on your front crampons really hard. Now, with a stump, that is putting a lot of pressure on that stump and you kind of increase the chance of one friction and, uh, but more importantly, potential nerve damage. And so you've got to look at how you're operating as a team. So again, we would never have him lead climbing, even when he was feeling strong, even if others looked like they could do with the rest. You're never going to put him up front or anything because you're asking for trouble with the stump. So mm. using again, using your kit. So the, the boys up front, kit, and I was often getting the ice axe out and, and cutting in steps to prevent him from having to try and kick in too hard, um, which we did, and it worked really well. Unfortunately, with him in particular, he was actually abseiling down on Pimori, um, and he was going a bit too quick and kicked in a bit too hard, and he ended up compressing a nerve, and that and that yeah. had a huge injury, a uh, huge impact on him. Um, so, again, you've you got to look at your individual knowledge and experience of, of your limb, um, kit and equipment, what you can do, who can you approach to try and make things work for you, and then, you know, the, the age-old adage of good teamwork and a functioning team to kind of look after each other and buddy up well in the expedition itself. And it sounds like, I mean, in mountaineering, self-care is so important anyway, but there's just, there's just another level, you know, making sure that that, that stump is looked after and that, you know, small niggles are, are rectified straight away and not allowed to evolve into, into a kind of uh, a climb ending um, event. Yeah, it, it, it's really key. It's like, it's like, you know, everyone's been there in the mountaineering world or the extreme kind of endurance endeavor world where you get to that point at times where you just want to put your head down and go into a bit of a mode where you're not really... You're just kind of seeing it through and getting on with it. You, you can't really afford to do that too much because it'll, you know, the injury or the environment will kind of see, you know, kind of teach you a lesson if you do so. A, a really effective buddy buddy system, really good personal yeah. administration and discipline. And as you say, the the key has got to yeah. be as soon as you get a niggle, as soon as there's an issue, you've got to stop and sort it out straight away. You keep going on it um, when you've already got a fairly significant debilitating injury as it is, and a compensatory injury is going to come on pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, tell me about, cause you, you had some, a uh, bit of a tricky situation on one of your summits of Aconcagua. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So we, uh, Aconcagua, the first attempt we, we went on that, we, um, we had a really tight weather window. Um, we had, it was uh, the year of, uh, it was 2016. So we had a, oh, I forget what the weather phenomenon is now, but it was a weather phenomenon that came in that basically meant that we had a, a hell of a lot of, a really long winter. Um, we chose to go really early in the season because for our stump, for our leg amputees, it's actually better for them to climb on snow and ice than it is to go on shingle. They'll they'll lose footing yeah. on the shingle a lot easier. Mm. So we wanted to actually get snow lower down um, f- uh, to really as part of our own risk assessment. And again, kit and equipment was good. The team were well prepared, so we weren't as worried about the uh, the risk of frostbite. Um, so we went early and. We had a short weather window, so we went from uh, went from Plaza de Bolas up to Camp Three in in one go. Basically, um, we had to keep an eye on each other from an acclimatization perspective. Everyone, we had one person that was sent down because they weren't acclimatizing. Um, so with that person and one of the IFMGAs went down together, and then the guide came back up. Big big day for him, <laughs> big effort for him. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, and then summit day came. We were going straight to summit day. So we went from base camp to one to two to three to summit attempt in four consecutive days. Um, Everything was going well, and then we got to literally. There's a, a route, depending on what route you're doing, but on the on the Polish route on Macankagua, Polish glacier route, we um, we kind of hit this little old, like a little weather broken down shack, and you kind of come around this, and there's a traverse, and the sun hadn't come up again, traditional alpine start. So we were in the cold, and it was it was Baltic, it was so cold. Mm. We, we didn't have any, uh, we didn't have anything on us to record the temperature at the time, but uh, put it this way, I, we, we we film everything we do, and I had a on the mineral base layer, I have a um, I have a big kind of pouch sewn in at the front with a Velcro pad on. So I have my, my sat phone battery in there and my a spare battery for the camera in there. And I took the camera battery out, put it in, turned it on, took one picture and the battery died. Um, and I've never, nice. I didn't have that yeah. in North Pole. I've never you know, I've had that 80,000 meters before. Yeah. So it was pretty cold. 
And uh, and then we hit we, we came over this hit this traverse uh, came over from the feature which then exposed us to the environment and we just got hit with this wind that was mm. it, it was consistent at about 35 40 and gusting up to 50 60 on top of uh, what must have been at least a minus 30 core so we had to i mean it was it was a pretty simple easy decision <laughs> it was like we're getting down and it was funny yeah. we'd overtaken a couple of teams on the way up and as soon as they saw us come back over none of them even waited for us to see them they all turned around <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh so, but I mean, I mean, that's not—it's not the first time, and it won't be the last time that we've had to abandon a summit attempt. And yeah. the biggest part of mountaineering, in my opinion, is, is you know you've got to, as difficult as it is when you've spent so much time and effort and training and cost to get to these places. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the mountain, and the environment, and the weather as the final say, and you've got to be prepared to abandon if, if that's what the conditions are telling you. And and um, and I've seen the, I've seen unfortunately I've seen the consequences of that not happening with other people, other teams. We did the same thing in 2012. We were just we're going through the kombu on that and on Everest and we uh, you know, avalanches were coming down at 1am in the ice field which is just that's just not normal it's not right you, you know the core yeah. temperature was just too warm that year and so our expedition leader on that I wasn't expedition leader on that expedition but the guy who was um, made a, a call to abandon it um, which hindsight's a wonderful thing you know he, he obviously made the right call we, we abandoned other teams abandoned other teams, some teams went on, but that year, sixteen people were killed in avalanches on Everest. Mm. You know, so yeah. you've you've got to be prepared to to pull when when the conditions in the mountains say no. Um, yeah, yeah. mountains always going to be there. You know, so we we did we pulled and then actually we went back to Wakankagwa the following year. We left a little bit later in the season. Um, yeah. We had a much bigger team. We had we, we had thirteen disabled team members on the second attempt, and all thirteen summited. It's really interesting to hear you say that. Speaking on the podcast in a previous episode to Cathy O'Dowd, who was the first woman to summit Everest from both sides. And that was her feeling about mountaineering was all about having that discipline to know when to quit. Uh, and you know, the rest of the world is uh, the, the, the kind of the dominant um, narrative uh, is all about, you know, never give up. Uh, and actually, uh, I think it sounds like mountaineering teaches you that there are times when you giving up is absolutely the right thing to do. Well, I think there's a big difference between giving up and returning to fight another day. Uh, and that's the way you've got to view it. Um, nobody should, and I don't think anybody, uh, nobody should facilitate an expedition to a high altitude mountain environment with somebody that isn't prepared physically and mentally to do it. So yeah. if you're going into that environment, then the, the concept of giving up shouldn't really be on a psychological level, because you're not physically prepared or mentally capable of doing it, it shouldn't really be there. It shouldn't really exist. That team should be prepared. It should be selected. It should be trained. There should be no doubts whatsoever that that team are capable of doing what you're asking them to do. You know, we are living in an age now where, you know, Hillary's climbed Everest first, you know, before him. You know, he he had questions around whether or not Mallory made it before. Did he get up there? You know, did he pass? Did he pass away, unfortunately, on the way down? All this kind Those endeavours have been done. We're living in a different time. We're looking at the time of performance, you know. So, yeah, if you are not in a position where you have trained and, and thoroughly prepared for whatever it is you're taking on now, yeah. then you kind of shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you've um, you've made a film that, unfortunately, due to the current circumstances, has been delayed. But that there is going to be soon, hopefully, a screening of, of that. Is that right? Yeah, hopefully, once uh, if and when you know it's safe to do so, we'll obviously be following the government guidelines on that. Um, but we've uh, we documented the Everest expedition. We've actually documented all of the expeditions we've done so far. But yeah. on return from Everest, we've made a, a short film specifically on that. Um, yeah. And yeah, if people are interested in that, we've got a place on the website, adaptedgunstam.com website, where we're going to be screening it at the World Geographic Society. So the idea is that we'll have a, a few of the team members talk a little bit about the expedition, um, followed by the screening of the film and then a Q&A afterwards. Great. So yeah, check out the, uh, the website, the AGS website, if you want to find out when that screening's taking place. Are there any other ways that people can find you online, Martin? Yeah, well, the web's, we've got a, we've got a Facebook page, Adaptive Grandstand. We have social media accounts um, and we've got a website. And it's not just the seven summit trips that we're doing. We've now, as we're starting to scale the organization, both the, the, the charitable side of it and the events business side of it, we're now basically trying to organize more challenge events for more members of the disabled community to get involved with. We've been doing an annual Yorkshire Dales Three Peaks, Penny Gent, Wernside, and Ingleborough. We do that as a team with our supporters and, and as many people that apply to that as possible. Uh, we've done that for six years now, an annual event. We do another event similar to that in Cumbria. We do an annual event in uh, in Chamonix, which culminates in a summit attempt of Grand Paradiso. So we're increasing our activity now and really trying to get as many people with disabilities 
involved in the outdoors and challenge events in a safe and supportive environment. And obviously to make it happen, we need able-bodied people to come along and, and pay for the pleasure because that makes it all happen. Yep. So uh, yeah, if anyone's interested in being part of something that's a little bit different, then get in touch. It must be incredibly satisfying when you see a team member who's gone through adversity in their life. Uh, perhaps they've had an industrial accident or they're a, a veteran from conflict uh, and they've they've had a life-changing injury and you, you're part of uh, that 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 journey with them where they achieve something incredible like reaching the, the summit of an 8,000 meter peak. That must be an incredible thing to be part of. It's uh, when I've, the biggest thing I wanted to achieve when I left the army was to regain what I had there, which was a combination of job satisfaction with a sense of purpose and identity. And as this is now evolving and developing, I'm getting more satisfaction and more a greater sense of purpose out of facilitating opportunities for others than me doing. You know, I've done a few things now. I'm kind of, if I die tomorrow, I'll be happy that I've lived, you know, and I've achieved a couple of things that I'm satisfied with. Um, but Everest, uh, I mean, I genuinely mean this when I say this. I, I took a lady to Everest Base Camp who had a paralysed right arm. She had a, a brain injury after a skiing accident. Um, physiotherapist, she's never in the military. Um, and she, you know, she came to us uh, fairly quickly after her injury. Uh, with a view to trying to join us for Aconcagua. And when she first came on the selection process for that, she couldn't walk two kilometres before she had to stop because the, she underestimated the significance the injury had had on her ability to walk, let alone climb. Fast forward, you know, four or five years later and her dedication to her own rehabilitation and a, a team around her to help her get to where she wanted to go, she walked to Everest Base Camp. Uh, when I got more satisfaction, I genuinely got more satisfaction out of seeing her get to Base Camp than I did out getting to the summit. Um, yeah, and we we're getting we're getting people doing that in in larger numbers now. Um, yeah. And I think if there's one thing we've learned from from COVID, it is that actually we as we live as a society, and it's important yeah. that we support one another. Um, there's been a lot of a lot of rhetoric in the media in the past kind of 10, 20 years talking around the differences in the modern era. You know, the military used to use the term snowflake generation frequently when describing people. Um, in comparison to previous generations, when actually, when we're faced with something that makes us assess who we are, assess our lives, assess what we want to be remembered for, we think more. And we are seeing now acts of kindness, acts of mutual support, acts of humility on a regular basis, far more than we did before this horrendous pandemic kicked, kicked off. And if we could take some lessons from that moving forward, it would be good for us to remember that and not simply go back to whatever whatever our past life was. Well, that's a really uplifting uh, note to to finish on. So thank you, Martin. Thank you so much for your, your thoughts today. No, thank you, Will. <laughs>